Very good. Well, thank you everyone uh, for, for attending today. I apologize for the little uh, glitch here that cost us a few moments, but I, I hope that doesn't uh, set, throw off anyone's schedule too greatly. And I wanted to, I guess, say good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, because apparently we have attendees from around the world in different time zones. So again, I'm Alan Shima, Mocon's Product Manager for Consulting and Testing Services. And today I'm going to give a the uh, presentation on the process of constructing a shelf life study. Uh, this, uh, pr the presentation is slightly different from ones I've done in the past here. Instead of going over uh, principles, concepts, and uh, we're going to go in a little more into the actual hands-on. When you're ready, okay, you say, I've got to do a shelf life study. What do I do next and how do I do it? So uh, let me just see if... Well, apparently, my oh, okay, my up and down buttons aren't working. There they go. So we're good. I again apologize. So I, I always start like to start with uh, what's the definition of a shelf life? If you were to research this, Google it, you'll probably come up with about a hundred million different versions. Uh, I found this to be the most apropos, very concise. It's a it's an objective means to determine the time a product can be expected to keep without appreciable change in quality, safety, and character. So with that said, you know, there's a lot of reasons why you want to conduct a shelf life study, and there's a lot of benefits, of course, to doing that. Obviously, you'll have confidence uh, uh, in uh, calculating your shelf life and not just estimating it, you know, if you, if you perform this study. There's a lot of times we do work for clients, and they're getting in that group point in there, uh, bringing their product to market, and they say, well, our competitors' products are all dated that they have six months shelf life or one year shelf life, so that's what we were going to do. Uh, so that's one approach, but you'll see that the benefits of actually running this study are going to do things like afford you the uh, prevention of recalls. Uh, of course, the whole intent of it is, is to maintain the quality, and then uh, your product brand and reputation. Uh, and of course, improve profitability. If you can reduce shrink or returns or product that's disposed of or sent back, uh, product recalls, things like that. Uh, and then if you could potentially avoid expensive litigations. We've actually been involved in cases where we've done shelf life studies and uh, packaging analysis and failure analysis and things like that for just that reason. And of course, consumer safety, probably the, uh, the most important of them all. All right. We put this slide in here just to give you some uh, idea of, of how much food out there is actually uh, disposed of, thrown away. And there's, you'll, if you look at the graph in detail, you'll see that there's X amount of it uh, percentages disposed of at the retail level. So it gets to the store and either goes bad while it's uh, sitting in the store's warehouse or, or back rooms uh, or out, even out on the shelves. And then there's an even higher percentage that gets thrown away at the consumer level, so after people purchase it. I, I, years ago, I actually, I don't recall where I read it, I, I saw a statistic that said that more food is thrown away and disposed of or spoiled than ever gets consumed. So just a, an in, interesting fact, if it's, uh, I believe it to be true. Uh, so... Now, getting back to shelf life studies, and we want to talk about, you know, when do you want to conduct your shelf life study, uh, and these are in addition to whys, again, are the reasons for it. Of course, if you're doing a new product launch, like I, I mentioned, uh, new packaging. You maybe have made some packaging changes or looking to make packaging changes, whether for aesthetics, cost-cutting, lightweighting, uh, going green, whatever the, the case may be. Uh, you know, uh, you might be collecting data for uh, validation process if your uh, product happens to be, say, a medical device or pharmaceutical, something like that. Uh, maybe you made a change in ingredients, intentionally or not. Sometimes uh, ingredients become unavailable, and now a uh, brand owner has to make a substitution. So you need to know uh, is that going to affect the shelf life of uh, the finished product. And of course, it's a, it's a good practice for your QA, QC programs. Um, and it's also a good check of is your current package uh, still performing the way it was intended to protect and preserve the product. Um, you know, it's a, of, of course, you have other QC procedures in mind there in place for monitoring uh, 
the raw materials you use for your package and all, but this is a great way to test the, the final finished package. So when you sit down and you're going to think about a, well, I got to put together a shelf life study, uh, there's certain factors you want to consider. Uh, these being the, the three main ones that I've found is, of course, you know, the safety of the product. You want to make sure that the, if it's a food product, it's going to be safe for consumption throughout the marked shelf life. If it's a medical device, it's more probably along the lines of maintaining the sterility of an intended shelf life. Again, for safety issues. The functionality of the product. Of course, you want it to function the way it was intended to function when it was manufactured. Uh, so if, it's, if it does actually, if it's say a cosmetic product, that's meant to uh, maybe like a skin tanning solution. You want to make sure that the functionality of that product stays the same. And then what I call the quality and marketability. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, what I mean by that is, um, I'll give an example. Years ago, we were actually working and did a study for a uh, large over-the-counter uh, cosmetics company, and they had a product. And uh, I'll just mention the product was a bright, brilliant white cream product, all right? And that's how it was recognized in the marketplace. Uh, and the product, though, was very, very oxygen sensitive. And what would happen if there was any residual oxygen in the headspace of the package or any uh, integrity issues with the package where oxygen could ingress or even the, the permeation rates of the uh, cap shoulder and tube areas of this product, if oxygen was getting in that way, the product would off color and it would go to say a gray and then eventually brown and even to a black color. Now the product actually was perfectly safe, perfectly functional. It would still function the way it was meant to, but from a quality and marketability perspective, it was no good because the customer, the consumers saw or used to a bright white product, they open it up and if that's not what they saw, the product was returned to them. Now, so just to give you an idea of what I mean by, by that, the last factor. So the biggest thing you have to consider when you're going to start to construct your shelf life study and you sit down and say, how am I going to do this, in what way, shape, or form, and how many samples and things like that, is you need to establish your end of shelf life parameters. And it's interesting that this is probably the most key factor of it all, and yet I see uh, issues in the field when we talk with customers all the time and we ask them, you know, well, what are your end of shelf life parameters? When you say your product is no longer good, what has changed? And a lot of people don't know the answer to that, ironically. Uh, but it's, you know, of course we want to maintain the accept acceptable characteristics of the sensory, human sensory, chemical, that's functional again, any microbiological issues, whether it's sterility based or if it's uh, more of a you know, mold, <coughs> excuse me, mold yeast, uh, bacterial issues with, say, fresh meats or other foods, um, and you know the physical characteristics. Uh, so things, you know, like the, the color and texture and things like that. Um, because if you don't know what what parameter determines that your product is no good, you you won't be able to tell what tests to employ. So your tests are dictated by your end of shelf life parameters. So for some products, it might be something as simple as, and you'll probably you'll see later in, in the, the case study that I'm going to present, um, it's basically a texture issue was the only concern with that product. Uh, that's a little unique that there is one main end of shelf life parameter. Typically, there's an array of shelf life parameters, but in the end, one of them is going to be your overall determining one for your total shelf life that you're going to code your product with. <clears throat> because even though there might be multiple factors, one of them is going to change before the other uh, or others to, to where that's going to be the one that dictates your shelf life in the end. But you do need to consider and analyze for all of them because you need to determine which one's going to occur first. There's two different basic classifications of methods for doing shelf life studies, and most of you are probably aware of this a direct method or a real-time method. So here, this is where you're going to store your product under uh, selected conditions for just slightly longer than your expected shelf life. Uh, so typically, if it's, you know, say here we're showing a photo of some apples, 
and I don't know, but off the top of my head, I'm sure people that are uh, farming apples and packaging them know that, well, the, these are typically good for three weeks at our recommended uh, storage conditions, whether that's refrigerated or ambient. So if they want to test that out, they're going to change their package or do something different to the uh, apple. You're going to store it for slightly longer than that and see if it meets your expectations. And of course, you'll just check it at regular intervals to see when the spoilage actually begins. The nice thing about the direct method, there's obviously no calculations involved. And uh, you, know, you see the effects of those precise conditions. So you can actually put the product in uh, either your recommended conditions, and then also you can put it in a stressful situation. So you could put it in a worst case scenario or anywhere in between and get data on how uh, those, those different storage options and, and conditions can affect the product. And these are always done typically for products with short shelf lives. So typically anything under three months and under is usually a pretty good guideline. Uh, once you get to you know, six months, a year, people typically can't wait you know, to do a real-time study to bring a product to market. So they opt for the second genre of methods called an indirect or accelerated method. The way this is almost done, I'd say 99.9% .9 of the time, uh, it's accomplished by increasing the storage temperatures. Uh, along with that, you can also adjust some humidities and things like that to give it a, a more accelerated and worst case type conditions. Uh, so the trial period is shortened, but the, and that's because the temperature uh, is a source of energy. Uh, it increases the rates of the deterioration or whatever the cause of, you know, whatever your end of shelf life parameter is. Uh, so of course the benefits, you don't have to run the full length uh, trial. Uh, you can see the impact much quicker of any changes that you're going to make. You know, so if you're considering uh, making, a, say, a, a package, uh, changing the construction of your package, and you have different optional material, you know, it's a quick way to kind of rule things out uh, and use it as a gatekeeper test for, for certain things. Okay, um, and this is always obviously done for products with longer shelf life from you know, over three months, but or even over six months, and we've actually even done studies for for people on uh, some products that have multi-year uh, shelf lives. So, to give you an example: if you were to to look at a real case kind of difference, you know, if you had something like fresh cold cuts, um, you know, you're going to use a direct method versus say something like cookies that might be good for six months to a year. You're likely going to use an indoor. So I won't go through all these, but it's, you can just look at it and see how um, all your test conditions and storage conditions and the way you structure the study, how you build it, is what we're talking about here today, is completely different. And it's not only different because one's direct and indirect, but it's primarily different because they're different products. So each, again, each one, I can't stress it enough, has to be treated individually. Okay. So before you begin your shelf life testing, uh, you really got to determine uh, a bunch of different things. So you want to determine things like your storage conditions, the test methods and protocols you're going to use, your testing intervals. So how often are you going to test it? Are you going to pull samples weekly, monthly, every three days? And then at the end, with all that information combined, you can typically determine exactly how many samples are going to be required for your study, which is always a big question. When we have uh, conversations with clients, that's their big thing. They, at the very end of the conversation, they always say, so how many samples do I have to send you? And we, it's pretty quick to figure out. After we had that discussion, discussion and came up with the above information, we can calculate it pretty quick. So again, determining your storage conditions with a real-time method, you have really two choices. You can prefer to do either expected conditions, so what it's actually going to be stored at. So again, typically it might be a refrigerated condition for a meat product or a produce product, or you might want to do worst case scenario. You know, um, obviously worst case scenario is going to give you likely the shortest shelf life, but uh, some people elect to do that to uh, err on the side of caution and code their product as such. Uh, to factor in some uh, temperature abuse that's going to occur in, in, in the normal, you know, uh, uh, retail chain process and, and warehousing and all. 
Uh, with the indirect or accelerated, what we do is we actually store it at multiple conditions, and typically two, and most and then are typically three, and uh, sometimes two, and sometimes you can even do more. Uh, but we always would store it at our standard storage conditions, what we expect it to see, and then of course we do it at the elevated conditions. And we elevate it typically in 10 degree Celsius uh, degrees of difference, and you'll see why in just a little bit when I get to uh, explaining that portion of it. So now we're going to determine our, our test uh, method and duration. Uh, so for duration, uh, for real time I mentioned earlier, you want to make sure you go just past expected shelf life. If it's a brand new product, then there really is no duration uh, because uh, you're, you're trying to determine how far can this product go. You know, so, so that's another option there. With indirect or accelerated, we usually estimate that you can uh, approximately go to one quarter of the expected shelf life. And again, as I start to explain the principles of a, an accelerated shelf life study, this will become more apparent why, how and why we estimate that. And it's uh, because of that accelerated process and the, the temperature changes we use. Uh, so determining the test intervals, typically it's, uh, you know, with direct methods, you know, you, uh, real-time stuff, you, you want to be sure, a, a good rule of thumb is to have, you know, eight to ten solid data points. Uh, and when I say solid data points, typically, so, you know, sometimes at the beginning of a study, you might get some fluctuations in the data. Uh, so, so there is a minimum amount of time you're going to, you know, store stuff before you would call it spoiled or anything. Uh, but we usually find for, like I mentioned, the cold cuts and things, it's typically in that three to five day range. We're going to pull samples out in that, um, and it could, so it can vary, but not much further than that. It's, it's, that's a pretty good rule of thumb. Uh, for indirect methods, the accelerated, uh, we usually do either weekly or uh, biweekly. So it, it depends, uh, you know, again, what we estimate. If it's a two-year shelf life product intended, um, sometimes we even ramp it up and change it. We can even... What we'll do is we'll say, okay, we don't obviously it's a, the product's targeted for two years and it's been engineered that way. So initially, we might test every two weeks. We'll pull samples for say the first month, month and a half, and then we'll alternate and switch to weekly. Um, and I, you, it's probably kind of understood why you would do that. We don't expect too much change in a lot of the stuff up front. Uh, but when we do start to see the changes, we want to make sure that we're pulling samples often enough to narrow down that window of time as to when it actually expired. You know, so if, if as an example, if we're running a, an eight weeks accelerated study, we want to make sure that it's, the product is going to fail and we're going to catch it uh, within, you know, a few days of when it actually failed. So if we had, say, we're doing a perfect example, if, we, if you did an eight-week study and you did samples at the beginning and samples after eight weeks and it failed, how could you estimate when it failed? You, didn't know, you won't know if it failed the day before you pulled those samples, a week before, four weeks before. So that's why you adjust your sampling period uh, to make sure you, you uh, isolate the failure time frame. So again, we're now we're going to determine the exact test methods. Now this is where it becomes uh, a true science and with some art. <laughs> so uh, you know this really requires a knowledge of the uh, commonly known parameters of the product we're testing and some scientific expertise. You know, so even though you might say if somebody came to us with a uh, tomato sauce. Uh, We've dealt with tomato sauce all the time, so we have a general idea, you know, from uh, just from our, our real life work experience of what we can expect and what's involved. But if you find out they have certain additives or ingredients in theirs that's not typically put in other products of that, it it that's going to change the study. So again, you need just the common knowledge mixed with the scientific. You know, when you combine the test intervals, like I said, uh, you know, if, if we know we're going to run five different tests and we can have enough sample uh, from one package to run those five tests, 
Uh, now, we would never rely on one sample poll, so we say, all right, we're going to poll three every week for the course of our study, uh, and we know we're going to run these tests. That's when you can come up real quickly and combine it and figure out exactly how many samples you need. Now, of course, you always want extras for several reasons. One is a lot of times you do some upfront work uh, that's uh, outside the scope of the actual testing of the product. And like we typically, and again, you'll see this later, recommend the first thing we do when we start a study is to uh, do some integrity testing. We want to make sure we're not wasting our time, going to put things in storage and run a test on a bunch of product that is already doomed to fail because there's uh, channel leaks in the seals or, or something like that. So we factor in samples for that. And then you always factor in some more at the end. You want to have some real life storage retains. And then in case you uh, find through your analytical procedure, you find some outlying data, something you didn't expect, you can actually still then go back and pull some more samples to verify, was that just an outlier or was this a real life occurrence? So the accelerated studies, you've probably all heard this, and sometimes it's a little hard to understand how it actually works. And uh, in preparation for this talk, I was always trying to think, what's the best way to state the rule of 10 and, and how that works with accelerated studies? And I think I came up uh, with a real simple way, and we'll see. We'll test it out. But basically, the rule of 10, or what's called Q10, um, Q10, the Q10 itself is a unitless quantity. It's, it's just a factor. You know? So a factor is something that you multiply something else by. Right? So it's a factor by which the rate increases when temperature is raised at 10 degrees that I mentioned earlier. Right? So there's a, an assumption uh, in, in whether it's chemistry, physics, food science, almost all chemical reactions, physical reactions, tend to follow this rule fairly closely uh, where the fact Q10 factor is 2. So in other words, if you raise the storage temperature or temperature of the system, whatever that case may be, 10 degrees Celsius, uh, the reaction rate will double. You know, Mokan, as Guy mentioned earlier, we're prominently known for our uh, permeation instruments around the world. And this is just, we've proven this a hundred million times over. If, if you measure the permeation rate of a plastic film at room temperature and then raise it 10 degrees Celsius, the, that transmission rate doubles. Okay, So um, the actual equation for the rule of 10 is this. So the R's represent reaction rates at the two different temperatures and then you add in your, your your temperature change. It doesn't have to be a full 10 degrees. It just works conveniently for calculations. You could, of course, just if you happen to do an 8 degree difference or 5 degree and you plug those numbers into the equation, you'll still come up with the same answer. Uh, so I did some example calculations here. Uh, but going back to what I said a few minutes ago, the best way to describe how this works, if you took a product and we put it in storage and let's say room temperature, and then we took another one, another sample, and put it in uh, 10 degrees Celsius higher storage. If the one in the accelerated condition, the 10 degree higher one, let's say after 30 days, one month, it fails. All right, using our Q10 rule of two, all right, so that's the factor. So now we say the accelerated one lasted one month. The one at real time will last two months. So you just take that storage time to failure multiplied by your Q10 value. And in this case, we're just assuming it's two. So that's the best way I found, figured I could describe it. The real story is you don't want to just rely on two because not anything in life is perfect. So this is why you actually have to run the calculations, and this data will show you why. So I just made this data up. I did three storage conditions, 20, 30, and 40 degrees C. And amazingly enough, those are 10 degrees apart, right? 20 to 30 and 30 to 40. And then we had some reaction rates that we measured. And it can be whatever, whatever it is. It could be uh, they could represent 
you know, uh, microbial counts. They could represent texture numbers, uh, rancidity indications, whatever, whatever that reaction rate, whatever that measurable data is. Well, if you take all that data and plug it into our equation that I showed you earlier, what you basically find is, and again, there's, I have two equations here shown, two Q10 calculations. I'll just back up and explain why sometimes it's not clear. It's because we have two changes of 10 degrees. So we're going to calculate our Q10 from the change from 20 to 30 and then recalculate it from 30 to 40 to determine our you know, repeatability and linearity of the calculation. And here's what we come up with. So our actual Q10 is 1.6 and not 2. Right? And to show you how that can impact your total calculations, if we ran the study, you know, 20 and 40 C, so here I'm only using two, two temperatures but 20 degree difference, we found the product uh, tested at 40 expired after eight weeks. So based on, on our Q10, uh, if we assumed it was two, here's how we'd run the calculation. We would take our eight weeks for the acceler accelerated time to failure, and we multiply it, factor it by our Q10 of two, and we do it twice because we went up two in increments of 10 degrees, we'd say, yep, the product can last 32 weeks or eight months. But in reality, when we take our real data from the tests that we're running and plug in our 1.6, you can see that the actual shelf life that we've calculated is much less, but also more accurate. So I, I hope that's pretty clear. So in summary, shelf life studies, they can be complex, uh, but they very much need to be product specific. And again, the key factors are you got to look at your safety, the quality, and the characters that make it marketable. You know, all these studies require detailed information about the uh, product itself uh, to establish the end of shelf life parameters, things like that. And we know that direct methods that I mentioned are for shorter studies, indirect are for longer. And then I, I hope I sufficiently explain the use of the and the meaning of the Q10 values for accelerated studies. Um, in the end, you know, typically what we deal with, probably 90% of the time, are food products. So most of our uh, studies that we do actually require expertise in food science. And we have uh, PhD food scientists on staff and as the function that, as consultants to MoCon. So that's something that we can, when we can work with somebody to build a study, uh, we have that, that knowledge base. But we all always rely on the manufacturer or brand owner for that the common knowledge of their specific product. You know, a lot of times what we do when we add the sensory part, we of course can put together a sensory panel or use our, our lab scientists to you know for their careers. Yeah, they can do the sensory. Did the color change? Does it smell different? But most times what we do is we add an additional amount of samples to our study and when we make our sample pull, we take those additional ones out, send them back to the brand owner or manufacturer because typically they're the best uh, at qualified at, at doing sensory analysis on their own product. You know, so that's, that's something else we can offer. So with that said, I'll, I'll rotate into our uh, little shelf life case study. All right, and uh, guys, probably listening. I, it looks like I'm right on time, <laughs> so I got about ten minutes to do the case study, and then we can uh, go to some questions. If we don't get to all your questions, we will get to them all. Meaning, we might not get to them live on this session, uh, but we will certainly uh, take all the questions and respond to them uh, via email or, or phone contact. So, in this case study, and this is. I wrote this. This came from an early on project we did uh, for a manufacturer of snack chips, potato chips, crisps, however you're, they're referred to in your part of the region of the world. And their goal was to extend the shelf life of their product from 16 weeks to 36. So they told us, yeah, right now everything, we, we get 16 weeks. That's what we put on our bags. And, uh, but we're, we have different ways we're trying to get to 36 weeks. And what they were doing is they, they actually were looking at making package changes, material changes to their packaging materials for the bags or pouches, and then also process changes. So they were considering should they employ a modified atmosphere system uh, in their new 
uh, new line to get to this 36 weeks. So we were doing an accelerated study uh, to analyze the package material and changes and the impact of the MAP, uh, you know, nitrogen gas wash. Um, the reason we were doing accelerated here, of course, because their goal was to get to 36 weeks. So you're talking more than, you know, half a year. So you could certainly do this real time if you had the, could afford to don't dedicate that much time to it. You know, you could package everything up and just store it and come back to it probably, you know, every two to three weeks, uh, probably two weeks, and, and do your testing. Uh, and then near the end, maybe do every weekly. Uh, but they wanted a faster answers, and again, they wanted to use it as a gatekeeper. Should we even consider this packaging material, or should do we need to consider MAP? We want to know now. Um, so the manufacturer, of course, supplied us all the samples packaged in the various films, and some of them were in the various films also combined with a nitrogen gas wash, uh, because with these chips being a, a, a fried product where there's oils and things, they, they can be uh, oxygen sensitive, and they're also extremely moisture sensitive. So here, the nitrogen, dry nitrogen, was being used to accomplish two things, exhaust out and any uh, or the bulk of the headspace oxygen, and also remove any ambient moisture. Uh, so we know that our, you know, most people know what they, just from consuming them, what the problems can be with potato chips, and the biggest one being is they're not crisp anymore. That's really the mainstay of, of our test was it's when the uh, moisture content of the chip got to the point uh, that it was, and we've all had it before, especially if you open a bag and kind of reseal it and a few days later you go back and at some point you say, yeah, these are no good anymore. They're not crisp, they're kind of soggy. <laughs> so uh, they become tough and chewy. So again, we're going to collect all this data over uh, uh, and determine the rate changes for the different storage parameters at the accelerated conditions, and then go back and do what I just did: plug it in for uh, for the uh, in the Q1 equation or a Q10 equation rather, and come up with those factors. So what our our testing proposal was kind of complex, though, for something that seems like a basic product, and here's why. We said we're, we're going to store them at 25C, which is considered typical room temperature storage conditions. And in this case, we said we'll also store them at 45C. Um, when you select your temperatures that you're going to accelerate, of course, you don't want to go uh, too high to where you induce changes simply due to that temperature. Again, you don't want that to happen. So of course, you wouldn't do, if we were doing chocolate bars, we wouldn't put those at 45C and then have a big puddle of chocolate to deal with. <laughs> so it's obvious, but other times it does take some food science background to know how high you can go. Give you a perfect example. We did a study which was really interesting. We should write a white paper on. We did a, a shelf life study on wine. And wine is super oxygen sensitive and super temperature sensitive. Uh, the, the Q10 values are enormous. So a very small change in temperature and your reaction rates, degradation rates go up 20, 30, 40, 50 times. So just to give you an example of how uh, important some of those things are. So what we did was we said, all right, we're going to put the samples in. We're going to pull them out weekly. And of course, here's what we're going to test for. And I'll walk you through why we did this. Um, some of it's their knowledge, that again, their common knowledge of the product, and then our food science knowledge. We, we tested them, of course, up, up front uh, for leaks, because we said if you're going through with doing this whole study and going to MAP them, we want to make sure that the samples we get in are, are good to execute this test with. Uh, we tested something called water activity. I'm not going to go over in this study what that is. A lot of you may be may know of it and understand the concept and the principle and the scientific importance. But water activity is is a nice analysis to do. It's a, basically a measure of the of what they call free water or water available in the food system or product system to partake in other reactions. Typically, reactions of degradation. So if we measure the water activity, and it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a great indicator of is there any potential for microbial activity? 
mold, uh, yeast, things like that. Uh, basically, under a specific water activity number, there is no chance of any microbial growth. So we we said, being that you know uh, this product is moisture sensitive and the nature of it being potato based, we we put that test in there. Texture, of course, that was one of our key ones because that's the typical end of shelf life parameter is when the texture's gone. You know, that's so we measured that. We do that. We can. There's several ways you can do that. You can do that with uh, human sensory, and also there's instruments called texturometers that can give you scientific uh, instrument data. We typically do both. All right. um, oxidation of fats. There's a couple different uh, chemical analysis you can do for uh, or spectroscopy. If we use uh, spectroscopy to analyze this in a lot of cases. The reason we're doing that is, of course, is rancidity. We know there's fats and oils and things present in our product, so we wanted to measure the rate at which they're oxidizing and see if we had any potential for rancidity. Uh, being that those oxidation reactions occur, we want to monitor our oxygen headspace you know, for several reasons. One is because of those reactions are oxygen sensitive, but also because in a lot of the package we we modified the atmosphere. So we want to see if we're how well we can maintain it and, and uh, hold that atmosphere. Uh, again, moisture content we're obviously going to do because we know that was the biggest uh, contributor to the degradation of the texture. And then we do, of course, the human sensory for taste, odor, color, and things like that, and even the texture, as I mentioned. So I'm not going to go through all this data in, in detail. I'll just tell you that these were our water activity numbers and that at both temperatures, uh, even at the highest level of, of water activity of 0.4, that told us there is no danger of microbial issues. Uh, so that was a, a great thing to know and establish uh, for, for our information and for the customer. One thing we did notice was when we did our texture measurements, the texture, uh, we noticed it started to change at about two to three weeks. So it, uh, at the uh, ex accelerated condition, uh, we really started to see where it was. Uh, there was noticeable changes, and you can see here on these, it lists the different film and MAP combinations. Uh, but again, it's, they did an array study. Right. Uh, our T-bar measurements is that's the method we use for the oxidation of fats and oils. Uh, that's uh, it's an acronym for the the type of test we do, and we saw basically no significant change. Uh, we didn't see any values that from start to finish where they, they went through the roof or anything, which was great. So we ruled out, okay, we're not going to have any rancidity issues. Oxygen headspace, uh, we didn't see any detrimental change to this. And obviously you can see, uh, you know, there's some, some things here, like the, of course on the upper graph, these lower ones are the ones that were MAP, so we got a lot of the oxygen out of the package. We didn't see any major changes in those values, uh, which correlates well with that T-bar oxidation of fats and oils. We saw no major change in either one of those. Now, the moisture was interesting. Uh, we found that if you, at the end when we analyzed the data, right, that the moisture content, when, we, when the moisture content reached 2.5%, that's when sensory started to detect a loss in texture which again was our main end of shelf life parameter. So if you see here on the graph, I guess you guys can just see my cursor. I'm pointing at the, uh, uh, if you go to 2.5% moisture here, uh, that correlates down to, you know, just over almost three and a half weeks or something. And I think if we back up to here, we'd said somewhere around that range we were seeing it, you know, the sensory was detecting that change. So to predict the end of shelf life, we calculated our Q10 values, and we determined in this case, I didn't, I'm not going to run all the data for you, but you can trust me, it came out to 2.19. So similar to what we found with my uh, made-up case study, but on the higher end. All right. So texture measurements and sensory evaluation indicated that the end of shelf life is reached at that level of 2.5% moisture. At this level, the chips, again, were tough, chewy, and stale. So based on all this, what we uh, came up with was, if you remember, we did 25C and 45, so two 10-degree incremental changes. 
our Q10 was 2.19. So we said in 3.4 weeks times 2.19 because it's a factor. And we did it again for the second 10 degree change. We calculated that their shelf life of their existing product to be 16.3 weeks. And if you remember, at the start of the study, they told us our shelf life is 16 weeks. So our data confirmed what they told us, which tells us we have extremely high confidence level in our predictive data. All right, so it, uh, it's, it matches up perfect with what they're seeing in real life. Okay. Uh, so um, just kind of what mentioned down below is how I walked through that calculation. With that said, here's a quick little summary of what we found. So if you took the accelerated data and the Q10s and calculated back, their existing film being the clear film performed just like they said, 16.3 weeks. If they went to film B, all right, uh, with non-modified atmosphere packaged, we predicted they could actually get 64 weeks of shelf life. And if they took that same great barrier film, and it's a great water barrier, and then added the modified atmosphere packaging process to remove any moisture and oxygen, they could actually get out to about 86 weeks. So these things could be sustained for over a year, uh, which was, you know, great news for them. So so the last thing I'm going to say based on all this is that, you know, you in the end, you're doing all this because of the safety and the marketability, uh, and but it all comes back to quality. You know, so now that you've spent the time to determine the correct shelf life, you want to ensure it's consistent. You know, yeah, you're probably buying your films or uh, packaging materials from the same supplier for years and all, but you still want to make sure, you know, are we confident we're still hitting our shelf life because that's the date we're still putting on the package. So that's, it really requires you to do a strict quality control and assurance program. So do some continued testing of the key products, the package, and the process parameters. So with that said, uh, we're going to, that concludes the presentation portion. And I guess, Guy, maybe you're going to come back online live. Yep, yep that's right. Um, we have a lot of questions. We've got about 10 minutes for the questions. Uh, one of the most frequent one is, how do we get a copy of this? Okay, we are recording <laughs> this. 